Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We welcome you this day as we rejoice in Christ and his resurrection from the dead on that, on that first Easter morning, this the sixth Sunday of Easter. So we are drawing nearer to the conclusion of our Easter season, yet we rejoice each Sunday morning that Christ has, has conquered death in the grave for us. The order of service we'll follow this morning is found on page 151, and yes, 51, that's red. Um, and that offering today will take the offering in the rear of the nave there, as we have in each of these past weeks, and then for our for our reception of the Lord's Supper in a, a single file line, we can come forward by family and, and start from back to front on this north side of the church and do our communion there at the chancel steps as we receive the sacrament this day. So as we rejoice in the gift of Christ and his resurrection, we begin with him 478. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. 
We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to be called the children of God and bestowed on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. i 
Let us pray. O God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. You may be seated. The first lesson appointed for the sixth Sunday of Easter is from the 10th chapter of Acts. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold power for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hand. He has put all things under his feet. The epistle lesson is recorded in the fifth chapter of 1 John. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 
Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Jesus said, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this, excuse me, I'm sorry, I saw John and started reading the epistle. Forgive me. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. Jesus said, This is my commandment, that you love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that what Ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. To you, O Christ. You may be seated for our children's message this morning. I'm going to come come out here a little bit more because our, our really mobile children are in, our, in the early service. So if you can bear with me a little. Have a, our Bible readings for today talked about bearing fruit and that God calls us, his children, to hear his gospel, to be fed, to, to bear fruit. And that fruit is our life and love and service. And today we're thinking of a very, a very special gift that God's given us, and that's moms. And it's only so much later that we realize what a precious gift that is, moms and dads, but we think what a blessed gift it is to receive the gift of moms. And he calls us to bear fruit in our verses. And I'm thinking about that today because, because the first three commandments are love, God. We could summarize them that way. You should have no other gods. Don't misuse God's name. Remember the Sabbath day. But it's love God. But the fourth one says, honor your father and your mother. And as we celebrate that today, I was thinking about that because Luther said, the person close, that, that God puts that one forth because, of course, the most important commandment is to love God. But whenever it comes to our lives in this world, the most important and closest person God's put to us are our moms and, of course, our dads. But we think of our moms on this day. Honor your father and your mother. Now, we're not very good at that a lot of times. I can remember a lot of times as a little one where mom said something I didn't listen very well, and I still can can do that when my mom says something, even at my age. And that's, we call that sin. And we pray, dear God, forgive us not for not honoring the one you've placed in my life. 
our moms. But you know who is the, the most wonderful and faithful parent of all? Is our Heavenly Father who loves his children, you and me, even in our failures. So we pray, dear God, forgive us for not listening and for not always honoring and obeying our mamas and help us to love and serve them. And God does love us and forgives us and helps us to bear fruit. And we do that today. I'd say a, a prayer of thanksgiving to God we'll say together and you can give mama a hug and tell her you love her this day. Let's say a prayer. Can you fold your hands? Dear Jesus, we thank you for our moms and all the blessings you give, especially for your love and forgiveness. And help us to bear fruit. In your name we pray, amen. Well, I'm not going to give you fruit this morning, but I think I have, I have fruit snacks, so we have any, some extras today, so I'll try, to, I'll try to let you pass those along. And then, is Ivan there too? Thank you. You're welcome. Um, you all, I'm going to make you share. I'm sorry. I have to bring one. Ivan. Oh, you have one. <laughs> Thank you, Kayla. There. There. She found, uh, we'll find another one. You're welcome. God bless you, and God bless you all today. We'll continue with our sermon hymn 470, not 478, 480. Let 
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our sermon text for this morning is from John 15. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So far the text. Probably the worst plague unleashed on humanity responsible for, for more deaths than any pandemic in recent centuries is the anti-Christian political philosophy of Karl Marx. It is super spread in our universities and media by people who excuse it, its atrocities with the notion that it just hasn't been tried by the right people yet. It's nearly impossible to get a true idea how many died of that political pandemic in the last century. As a philosophy, it is purely destructive. Destructive of the family, spiritual, cultural, and political institutions. It sows anarchy. It sows a lack of, of respect for authority and civil order. It can only and only does tear down it lacks all capacity to build back positively. Now, I have that in mind because this week I noticed a smarmy professor likening motherhood to a form of eco-terrorism, railing against, against God, the true God, the eco-Marxist worship nature instead. But they will never live under the misery that their ideas create. That misery is reserved for their foolish students and followers. Now, it's not only misguided professors who devalue the gift of motherhood and family more broadly. I saw a survey this week, 59% said that a woman should tell an employer she had kids when applying for a job. 41% thought it would hurt the woman's chance of getting that job. But I saw a focus group on the Today Show talking about it. And it was interesting because the guys were all kind of thinking, well, unless they were just agreeing because they didn't want to come out on an edge and make a... But the guys were all thinking that it's a positive thing, a constructive, a good thing, that they should mention it because it showed... A, a strength and the multitasking ability was the, uh, the idea that came up. And that's all well and good. The women, on the other hand, said, no, you better not because you might be punished for it. They were fearful that the family would be considered a, a hindrance to work performance. I don't know. It doesn't make any difference where you kind of come down and can understand wariness. But this time of year, it, we kind of talk a good game about the gift of mothers, but for the most part, I think that that reluctance shows that our culture doesn't really value them. It even ridicules uh, the June Cleaver types of mother, those who choose the home for their vocation. Now, this sermon isn't really about whether a, a young girl wants to be a, a doctor or a lawyer or a nurse or a farmer or an engineer. It's about Christians on this day of all days, affirming the importance, the godly importance of family, if it be God's will. And that marriage is a blessing if God provides a Christian spouse. And that children aren't a form of terrorism against the earth, nor something to be vaccinated against. But they are a gift of God to be received if it is God's will. We affirm today Christian families praying at the family altar, meals together and reclaiming the priorities of the Christian home from the school activities and the coaches. Yes, today we rejoice in the gift of, of our parents, especially moms. We affirm parenting in a, in a distinctly Christian way so that our kids don't circle the cultural toilet 
on their way to hell. Even so, we remember this day that there is only one perfect heavenly Father. And we are members of His family of grace, not because of the great performance that we do in our own vocations. Rather, God extends His grace to you and to me, to moms and to dads, husbands and wives, sons and daughters. And as often as we fail in these important callings, God's grace is still bigger than your failures. That said, it's important today of all days to say something to affirm God's will for the family. Being Christian, being a Christian mom, of course, means developing prayer calloused, bent knees, learning and and sharing God's word and discipline and conversation. A Christian mom is a professional teacher, a counselor, a doctor, a nurse, a chef, a janitor, a launderer, a chauffeur, a waste, waste removal expert, a party planner, a child care specialist, and a million other jobs are moms, all rolled into one. It's truly impossible to assess a mother's value. The Christian mom's highest calling and and greatest value lies in the sanctifying place in her home. 1 Corinthians 7 says the godly mom sanctifies her family as the love of Jesus shines in and through her heart by her word and witness. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you for such moms. Many of you, like I, will one day whisper a prayer before God in heaven, a prayer of thanksgiving for moms who prayed with us and for us and brought us to the throne of his grace to hear about Jesus, to hear about a love greater even than the love of any earthly parent, about God's love in Christ. No other vocation in Scripture is as highly praised as the Christian mom. Now, it's true, dads are called to be, they are given the charge, rather, to be sacrificial servant leaders in their homes. Godly husbands have a job, and it is to mirror Christ to their families, as Christ to his church, who loved his bride. Leaders with godly courage and conviction are what men are called to be in their homes, even willing to lay down their lives for their families. That is a man's God-given job before Christ. With the possible exception of 1 Timothy 4, where it says pastors who insist on pure life and doctrine save themselves and their hearers, I can't think of any vocation as highly praised that stacks up to his verdict on motherhood. Only of mothers, as it said in 1 Timothy 2, she will be saved through childbearing if she continues in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now notice there, moms too are are saved in their continuance in faith, not simply the biological function of, of giving birth. But I think if it says anything, it says God thinks Christian moms are very important. The psalmist even says that they share in his creative work. He knits us together in our mother's wombs, fearfully and wonderfully made. So we'll say a few words about the Christian family. God calls husbands and fathers then to mirror Christ in loving service as the head of their homes and wives to submit themselves in reverence to Christ. And this in a complementary relationship where the the two and two add up to four, that a complementary uplifting building relationship rather than a tyrannical one. The godly man is not called anywhere to be the king of his home perched on the throne. A husband's headship in the home doesn't diminish or make less, but rather exalts and supports the wife in Christ, and the mother. It provides a shelter for the mom's gifts, the wife's gifts to flourish and to be praised and commended. Husbands, love your wives 
as Christ loved the church, Ephesians 5 says, see, the church never begrudges a Christ who died for his, his people and who says, I've not come to be served, Jesus, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. So little would, would the godly man in Christ, should a wife begrudge her husband's service for Jesus' sake. The godly woman in Christ is blessed when the godly man leads and sacrifices and empties himself, even willing to die for the sake of his home and family. And to such a one, not because of his brilliance, but to such a one, a godly woman can say, thanks be to God. Where the world preaches independence, the Christian woman knows that it's good for her and her home to have a man who models Jesus. It's good for both, for husband and wife, as they, when both husband and wife affirm and support the other. So it says a little bit about how we should parent, because from early on, boys have to be taught to be Christian young men. They have to be taught that God wants and wills them to be servant leaders in their churches and in their homes and in their communities, not spoiled, rotten uh, brats, entitled kings in need of being served, but servants with a heart to model lovingly Christ's care for his bride. And any woman would be wise to run away from a prospective husband whose mom waits on him like an, an infant. Right? So parents also teach your daughters to be godly helpers, encouraging and affirming your husband to be the head of your home, not to be spoiled princesses. Any boy would be wise to run away from a prospective wife who, who disrespected her father. Both our sons and daughters are taught that Love isn't something you fall into, a fleeting emotion, because you like the outward packaging. It's not using somebody else's body until you decide whether it's time to commit. Love is a commitment under Christ. It's a commitment through the hard times as well as the good. So, dear young people, if you are at or near dating age, don't ever, not even for a moment or in in evening, don't ever begin to give your heart to someone who doesn't love Jesus and can't be what God desires in your home. Boys, if, if the girl that you're dating would never consider submitting to a husband out of reverence for Christ, as Scripture says, run away as quickly as you can. It is not worth the heartache and the fighting. Girls, if he is entitled and lazy, and in your mind you could never imagine entrusting yourselves or submitting to him as your godly head, run away. You won't change him after marriage. You notice the interesting thing about his injunction to men and women, husbands and wives. God never commands a man to make sure that his wife submits. He never commands a wife to make sure that her husband is, is the godly ruler in her home. When Paul addresses God's word there, God speaks to each of us on our own, calling for us, addressing wisdom that we each take care of our callings as God outlines. Now, husbands and wives who follow God's plan for the family, in the end, they become too concerned with, with loving service to one another and emptying themselves in service to one another that they're not able to keep score, not desirous of keeping score over who has the authority and who has the boss or who's in charge. And life becomes better for both. Both are fed and nourished in God's grace and forgiveness. And both... Let God's love flow through them into their families. And where there's tyranny and lovelessness on the part of the husband, or rebelliousness and a, a willfulness and a power struggle on the part of the Christian wife, and it happens. That's part of our lives as, as sinners. Well, then repentance and mutually sharing God's forgiveness reorders the marriage. 
the God, the Christian marriage, the dominant voice is the gospel. We're confessing our sins to one another. We remind each other of God's love. Forgiven sinners loved by God give forgiveness and sinner and, and forgiveness and grace to other sinners also loved by God. Godly homes are not perfect. They're rooted and established in the heavenly father who did send his perfect son, sacrificing his own life for the sake of his bride, the church. See, Jesus didn't wait for you and and me to, to get it right, to get ourselves all in order. Christ Jesus came to save sinners, and that's in every family. Today, we thank God for the Christian family, and more specifically, for moms. We pray strength for those who long for the gift of marriage and family. And we pray God's grace and blessings and strength for those whose relation to their parents is different now. And they've become the caregiver, perhaps. See, honor your father and your mother is the first commandment, the only commandment within earthly, a temporal promise that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth, God says. That commandment, honor your parents, applies whether you're young or old. Sometimes as our dearly loved parents age, that may not mean simply obeying everything that they instruct. But honor and care in some moments might mean making decisions that they wouldn't favor to get and give them the care that they may not, that they may need, but not want. The fourth commandment, the only with an attached promise, you'll live long on the earth. And I think it's because it works in both directions. Moms and dads support and nurture us when we're young, and God would have us honor and care for them as they get older. Whether it be husbands to wives, parents to children, or children To their parents, we never quite reach the ideal God's law demands. True love is embodied in sacrificial commitment. And I don't reach it, and you don't either. Just as Eve was drawn from the side, was drawn from Adam's side in the Garden of Eden in paradise, Jesus, the bride, Jesus' bride, the church, was born from his bloody side. As 1 John 5 says in our text, through the water and the blood, from that water that spilled forth when Jesus was pierced on the cross, he emptied himself for you. And it wasn't in a fleeting emotion while you still looked good and young and healthy and strong, but it was in sacrificial service and love for your sake and for all of his church. He stepped into our world of of marital and parenting kind of fits and starts and family resolutions and failures. And our Savior is bigger than our sins, even against our family vocations, those that that perhaps grieve us deepest. He gives you a new heart. You've been born again in the water and spirit and blood, betrothed to your Savior until the day we enter his wedding feast. Christ loved the church, Paul wrote, and he gave himself up for her, his bride, the church, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. In his precious baptismal gift, washing with water through the word to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but holy and blameless. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We rise. And now may the peace of God, which passes human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess the faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, found on page 158 in the four part of your hymnals. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, 
begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. And we remember in our prayers this day the gift of our mothers and God's blessings upon them. We remember our sick and our hurting, especially we think of Eileen as she's still in the hospital, that, that God would give her grace and strength and healing. For Arlene and Louie and Rose and Julie, for Terry and Debbie, for Dan and Missy and Fern, for Guy and Bill and Mina and Joyce and Kim and Walter, Jana Lee and Bev, Anita, Allie and Lauren. Let us pray. Gracious God, you do not reject our prayers or remove your steadfast love from us. Hear us as we pray for your whole church and for all people according to their needs. You invite us to freely come and hear your word. So bless and increase our faith that we may rightly fear you and learn what you have done for our souls. Gracious Father, we pray that you would bless your church in this and in every place, that you would be with our synod and Matthew, our president, Mark, our district president, Bud, our circuit visitor, for our pastors in Christ, Stephen and Dennis, for Lorna, our deaconess, Jeannie and Cassandra, our teachers. Lord, we pray that you make our homes outposts of light in a world of darkness. As you gather husband and wife around the family altar, that you would build up a community in that place, richly strengthening and encouraging one another and serving each other in love, even as you serve us through your word of life. Lord, in your mercy. God of all grace, we praise you and thank you for for our earthly lives and blessings, for the rain and sunshine as you know we need, for the farmers in the fields that you would, would grant them success, success to their labors as through them we receive their daily bread. Bless our president, governor, mayor, and every elected leader, those who make, administer, and judge our laws. We commend them to your care for wisdom and godly insight. We pray for our nation, for our military men and women in dangerous places who serve, especially Daniel and Douglas and Caleb and those that we name in our hearts and for their families during their separation, for our police men and women, our fire personnel and our EMTs. Lord, strengthen and keep our medical workers and their families during this pandemic time, and we pray that you would put an end to it once and for all, but grant us patience and trust if through it you drive us to our knees calling upon you. For Tom and Mark and Jared and Gabby and Evelyn and Diane, for Kathy and Shelley and Deb and Lori and Becca, we commend them to you and we pray your good and perfect will be done as you serve through them and all of those who serve us in their vocations. Lord, in your mercy. For our sick and hurting for the brothers and sisters that we've named today and for their families as they walk through the valley, that you would give them patience and trust until the day you grant deliverance, peace, and health here in time or with you in eternity. For the gift of our moms, that you give them 
joy in their labors, that you would give them faithfulness in their vocations, that you would help them to receive each day as your blessing, and that you would surround them with a community, a family, who love them and build them up, even as they are encouraged and strengthened by you, the true vine who nurtures the branches to bear fruit to eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. These and all things we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue on page 159. What shall I render to the Lord? Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, and most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death and by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Welcome to the Lord's table. Robert, the true body of Christ. John, the true body of Christ, given it to death for your sins. true blood of your Lord and Savior shed for you for the remission of all your sins. The true blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of all your sins. May this true body and blood of your Lord keep you to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, give it to death for our sins. Thank you.
blood of your Lord and Savior, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. It will remain standing for our closing hymn. be seated. A few announcements before we go this day, especially, of course, this day we are thankful to you moms and, and pray God's blessings as you, as you are encouraged and, and uh, supported by your dear ones. For those of you who's, whose mothers are, are aging and, and becoming more and more frail, we, we pray God's strength for them and especially we remember 
Eileen in the hospital this morning for God's blessings to Eileen. Just a couple of things, I think. We have to do have a church council meeting this Tuesday at 6 o'clock. Then we have a vacation Bible school meeting next Sunday, after, uh, at probably at 10 o'clock, to continue to, to, what, to get busy on our planning. We met last week, and, and our goal is to have a, a mask-optional uh, vacation Bible school in August from the 2nd through the 6th, something that uh, if parents would like, they can have their kids, or, or if, not, if they dislike, then not have to, to wear the mask. And uh, I assume that probably means workers also for those of us certainly that have, have been vaccinated. There, the registration deadline will be July 16th. All of that is going to be revisited as we get nearer. Right? So who knows? We pray that this will be a, a distant memory uh, by then. I know that that's not, not going to be the case. But, uh, so we'll, we will be thinking about that. But what we need to know is who is willing to help. You know, if there's a little, a little boy or girl without a mask, if you're willing to stand over a table and help her and, and to walk around with her. So please sign up. Let us know in the church office. Um, that's our goal and intention. The spring cleanup is going to be Saturday, the May, May, May 22nd. Derek, do they need to know anything special about that? So there be so they'll put together I guess a, a chore list, and I know if you can't and you're traveling whatever you may be uh, have some time during the week you want to come in I know that would be welcome too but that's going to start at 9 a.m. there on the 22nd and then the 23rd our graduation breakfast so we thanks thanks be to God for our graduates have a wonderful day have a wonderful uh, celebration as you give thanks for the gift.